Jai Hind, Namaste and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to the day's program by Center for Knowledge Sovereignty. I also extend a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker of the day, Lieutenant General P. R. Shankar. Sir, thank you for joining us. It is our pleasure to have you with us for the second time now. Before I introduce the speaker, I will briefly introduce our think tank CKS. CKS is a non-partisan nationalistic think tank established more than a decade back with focus on these spheres of information technology, geospatial technology, public policy, research, and national security along with geopolitics. CKS has been a pioneer in spreading awareness about data sovereignty and cybersecurity at strategic, political, and national levels. Do visit our website, www.ckindia.org to know more about us and for regular updates. I also request everyone to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter as well to stay updated. Over the past few years, CKS is privileged to host on its platform several discussions, roundtables in person. And since COVID-19, we have initiated virtual discussions as well. The Spake Generals is one such program which has completed four seasons with huge viewership. Today, we are happy to have our third talk of the fifth season of our highly acclaimed flagship webinar, The Spake Generals. In the last four seasons, we had the privilege of hosting excellent speakers and thought leaders on our platform, such as Lieutenant General Shankar, who is also with us today, Lieutenant General S. Kulkarni, Lieutenant General Atta Hasnain, Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha, Air Marshal S.S. S. Soman, AVM Arjun Subramaniam, Air Marshal Anil Khosla, Lieutenant General D. S. Hudda, Lieutenant General Zamir Uddin Shah, Vice Admiral Anil Chopra, Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma, Rear Admiral Sudarshan Srikhande, Air Marshal D. Chaudhary, Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar, Lieutenant General Shokin, Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia, Lieutenant General Vinod Khandare, and Lieutenant General Satish Dua. In this season also, we have a very impressive lineup of acclaimed speakers. We had Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma and Air Marshal Anil Khosla in the last two weeks. Today is the third talk. Also, kindly make note in your calendar that our next two talks will be on two consecutive days. That is on 23rd of September, Saturday and 24th of September, Sunday, back to back. We are not doing any event in the next two weeks on Sunday, but our event will be next on 23rd September, Saturday and 24th September, Sunday. Please note that the views expressed by the speakers on this platform are their individual views and CKS is merely a platform hosting these talks. I request all the members of the audience to put their questions in the chat box, addressing it to AVM Sinha sir at the end of the talk so that the speaker is not disturbed. Please keep the question short, crisp and relevant to the topic. We are also currently live on our Facebook page of CKS and the talk will also be available on the CKS YouTube channel shortly along with the other social media handles. CK is honored and privileged to host on its platform the fifth season of our flagship webinar, The Spake General. Today, in our third talk of the series, we are honored and privileged to have once again in our platform a very acclaimed and highly decorated veteran, Lieutenant General P. R. Shankar, PVSM, AVSM, VSM, former Director General of Artillery. General Shankar is an alumnus of prestigious Defense Services Staff College, Wellington. Naval Post Graduate School, Monterey, and National Defense College, New Delhi. The general had hailed many important command, staff, and instructional appointments and has vast operational experience of serving in all kinds of terrain and operational situations, including counter insurgencies. He gave great impetus to the indigenization and modernization of artillery and was instrumental in induction of guns like Dhanush. M777 ULH, Sharang, and K9 Vajra, also known as also the Pinaka, Brahmos, and Grad BM21 systems. He worked under late Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, who was the Honorable President of India and an acclaimed scientist, Lieutenant General VJ Sundaram, and Dr. VK Saraswat, member of the Niti Aayog in DRDL Hyderabad in the 80s during initial development of the Agni and Prithvi missile systems. He was a member of the committee to evolve the long-term technology perspective plan of the DRDO. 
He is a member of the Chennai Center of China Studies and has co-founded CASA, a virtual think tank on current and strategic affairs. Presently, General Officer is a professor of practice at IIT Chennai and is actively involved in applied practical research there. He also advises the Tamil Nadu government in the development of defense corridor and has written over 300 articles on strategic affairs, defense planning and defense technology. His articles are widely read on www.gunnershot.com. Now I request Air Vice Marshal Pranay Sinha, ABM retired moderator of the session to take the program further. Ladies and gentlemen, ABM Pranay Sinha in his 35 years of distinguished career hailed many important appointments in the Indian Air Force and post-retirement worked as an advisor to Bharat Electronics Limited for three years. He is presently engaged as a strategic advisor to the IIT Mandi and is an active member of our think tank. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, madam. Viewers, uh, madam Sumitra Gwenkaji is director right in Infotech, CEO Triangle Global, and our strongest pillar of strength main sutradhar of CKS India. Very good evening viewers to this third talk of our flagship webinar, The Speak Generals. But before I invite the scholar soldier general, let me contextualize the subject of the evening in a minute. As per Sri Xi Jinping, son of heaven, head of the party, government and military of China, has given the assurance to his countrymen for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation by 2049. That is by the centenary celebration of the People's Republic of China. And one of the main strategies to achieve this aim is to boost their economy at the same time, insulate it from the world's blockades and sanctions, and to lessen the impact of economic slowdown, which is going on presently, as well as of sinking population. This is by reducing its dependence on foreign supply chain, and by boosting its domestic consumption through dual circulation achievable by military civil civilian fusion, MCF. To build an integrated national strategic system and to support the goal of national revisionation, MCFs can leverage emerging and cutting edge technologies developed for civilian use to boost its military capability. China has adopted a whole society effort to acquire it by all means, including technology theft, force transfer, or diversion of civilian know-how to achieve leadership in AI, artificial intelligence, nanomaterials, newer energy technologies, quantum cyber technology to trigger economic as well as military gains. Well, we are today, we all are aware that how the mighty military industrial military complex MIC of USA is driving its economy. At present, when most of the Western world economy is going down, the US big five weapon manufacturers, Lockheed Martins, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Northam, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, have made huge profits due to ongoing Ukraine crisis. And the US Mike's future looks very promising as long as the world remains geopolitically unstable and lingers in crisis and chaos. During World War II, USA went through a process of intense civil military fusion. The entire American might focused on churning out military equipment which could beat the Germans and Japanese qualitatively and quantitatively, and they did it successfully. The mighty might of USA which drives the economy is all about seamless civil military fusion. This is what China wants to replicate and is doing with great success. In case of China, please note that for the military, it is the civilian companies to work first. Any commercial benefit of theirs comes thereafter. It is for this reason that it is referred as military civil fusion in China rather than generally known as civil military fusion elsewhere. And most important factor in civil military fusion is breaking of silos, the barriers, the wall with policy hammer and integrating various government departments and organizations to break the inter-ministry rivalry, interstate competition, all through empowered structure and well-defined hierarchy. It has to be a top-down approach. 
in fact the first step is politico military bureaucratic fusion if this can be achieved even partially we will have our way and to suggest how this can be attempted in india let's turn to the most prolific writer blogger strategic thinker general pr sankar sir over to you uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, a vice marshal pranay sena at the outset uh, it's a great pleasure to be back at the cks and talking about this important subject i'd also like to thank mrs uh, sumitra goenka for the generous introduction uh and i also it, it's in fact indeed a great uh, pleasure for me to meet mrs uh, you know i mean I, not mrs i i would say everyone on cks and um, you know to speak once again on your platform uh, of course a special mention of course to mrs deepa prakash because she gives me a lot of enthusiasm when i write my articles and gives me some feedback right having said this uh, today's uh, topic is civil military fusion now civil military fusion is not something very new it's it's pretty old right it's only that it's come into focus recently because the chinese have made it so uh do we need civil military fusion there is no doubt about it right has is civil military fusion a new thing it is not it's a pretty old concept but we need civil military fusion for india not the chinese model we need civil military fusion for india not the american model and if you think uh, only usa and uh, china are in civil military fusion no the same thing exists in russia also so what we'll do today is i'll take you through a few paces because uh, over a period of time ever since i've started studying this subject i myself have changed my ideas as to what civil military fusion in india is required to be done right with this i what i'll do is i'll share my uh, screen and my slides and we'll go through the whole thing uh yeah i hope everyone can see it can i get a confirmation yes yes sir yes sir we are yeah thank you yeah. right uh so this is uh, so, so today i'll cover the whole thing and i'll keep explaining as i go along as to what this whole uh, story is all about okay now if you see this uh, you know cartoon this is from the south china morning post and it shows a world being split by you know mr biden narendra modi ji uh, xi jinping and putin it is actually reflective of the times and if i extend it a little further today the world is in a uh, you know quadrilateral india is in a quadrilateral which i call it the global power matrix right where two ends of the quadrilateral are represented by usa and india right with attraction in between them and at the other end of the quadrilateral is china and uh, russia the other two great powers of the world who are attracted to each other the problem with this quadrilateral is that it is being pulled from all directions and opposite directions but what is the reality today is that usa remains the dominant power in the world china is an aspiring power but weakening due to its declining economy and demography russia uh, has is entering a phase of weakness due to its prolonged ukraine war and in times to come it might not recover so easily and of course we have india which today is getting on to the center of the global stage it is a growing power which is emerging from its own reticence so this whole story of civil military fusion has to be seen in this context because if india has to be a power in its own right and be an important player in this global matrix there is no choice but to go through Uh, the civil military fusion right the climb to the top will be steep and we have to understand in this climb there is going to be conflicts and wars and these wars are likely to be long unlike what we thought of so far that it will be short and sweet wars i think the ukraine war has shown something completely different and you need a whole of the nation approach to go where you have to go and for all this you need civil military fusion without Uh, I out of a doubt. Okay, having said that, there are a few technologies which I call civil military technologies of this century. 
what are these uh, technologies if you see these are quantum computing ai space fiber space or uh, additive manufacturing synthetic biology which is something which i never realized existed till a few days back right semiconductors energy manned unmanned systems data sovereignty which of course when you say knowledge sovereignty you're also talking of data sovereignty and then we are talking of communication and networking and if you see the characteristics the elo ones tell you all these things are not only made in the military but it is also you know in the uh, civil domain in fact their origins are from the civilian environment right and especially here i'd like to highlight the energy which is uh, the fusion energy which has been discovered or rather tried out twice in the livermore lab which is going to change everything across in the future after all we must remember all this uh, you know going up to moon and chandrayaan and the pragyan thing everything is all about searching for energy to go into outer space okay what is the us model like what uh, the avs marshall said usa went through a process of intense civil military fusion during the second world war and they evolved their uh, military industrial complex it was producing military aircraft by the hour tanks by the day and warships by the week or even less the entire in american industry focused on churning out military equipment which could beat the germans and japanese qualitatively and quantitatively and they did it successfully and they exhibited this this level of civil military fusion in the last century just about 80 years back and it, this was at the end of the depression if anything this kind of a civil military fusion is what brought america out of its own depression and from then it has not looked back right now what is the model you have to see what the model is all about first and foremost civil military fusion in usa is intrinsic to its society there is no like i i just showed you all the military technologies civil military technologies of century originated largely from uh, the civil world and they are part of the society okay they are not dis- designated or discussed as civil military fusion in usa right they use this spoken of as uh, civil you know dual use technologies the technologies are highly disaggregated but focused there is a tremendous focus the development is disaggregated and the utility is completely aggregated now the next point is that the cutting edge technologies are being researched and developed in the usc usa in the private sector at scale and these are being you know realized not in the traditional military industry complex that's gone beyond that open ai ai is not a mi is part of the M, uh, traditional mic of uh, usa or for that matter that livermore lab is not uh, you know part of uh, darpa that's the interesting part what is happening is outside the traditional thinking of uh, mic but it is a key component of the us economy okay the, the 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 part which is actually more interesting and which we need to adopt is that the military industrial complex has traditionally been the designer developer producer and supplier of supplier of cutting edge technology and weapons globally and they have a global reach there is no doubt about it right and that has powered their economy to a greater level and that has triggered a lot of inventive thinking and next generation technology for uses everywhere okay now when you look at the uh, chinese model it's a little different right it is a six faceted model it fuses the defense and civil technology and the industrial base and that's what it, the avm also did mention it looks at integration of science and technology innovations and the, all this you will see uh, uh, the fundamental reason you will see the slight difference between these two model i won't say slight difference there's a hell of a lot of difference is because of the the gulf in technology which or the chasm in technology which exists between usa and china let's not have any doubts about it there's a big gap 
and that is not going to change and especially with the chips act coming in it also talks of blending expertise and knowledge and talent cultivation which means in the chinese model there's lack of talent it also talks of civilian infrastructure and construction being leveraged for military purposes by building them to military requirements and standards right now if you see the us model they don't talk of all this why is china doing all this because it lacks in many of these issues right now the civilian services and logistics are utilized for military purposes dual use now all aspects of society and economy are utilized for mobilization of resources resources and capabilities for defense of the nation they it's again a whole of the nation approach okay what does it do what does the civil military fusion what does what is the structure all about i mean you know that's the interesting part the interesting part is that it got established somewhere in the turn of the century but it lingered in uh, in china as civil military integration but they didn't find it useful xi jinping when he came into power said that i am going to do, do something different and then in 2015 civil military fusion or military civil fusion whichever way you call it it was elevated to a national level strategy why to build an integrated national strategic system and capabilities to support the goal of national rejuvenation the first part is very clear na- integrated national strategic system and capabilities what is this goal of national rejuvenation it's up in the uh, up for grabs and it depends on how you look at it many say it's part of the sinocentric world order many say it's just to grab taiwan but definitely if you take the worst case scenario they want to be the most dominant power on the earth and that's what they call national rejuvenation now the interesting part here is that the overall management and implementation of this entire civil military complex is monitored and managed by the politburo which is the highest body in china the state council the state council is virtually something like our ccpa or the ccs the way you like it a cabinet committee of a committee of security or cabinet committee of political affairs or some, whatever it is at the apex level the core of the ministries and it includes the national development and reform commission and the central military commission so one of the things which you see in the civil military fusion in china is that there is a fusion at the government level and the military level now a central commission for Mil- military civil fusion development ccm cfd was established in 2017 it was headed by xi jinping along with premier li keqiang of course today's uh, premier will takes over li keqiang is retired so you see that this whole business of civil military fusion is being headed by the top people and it is a top driven uh, strategy and is a key factor of their whole story right the most powerful people and organs of the state own and implement civil military fusion there's nothing lesser than that okay now what is it there for india india in india we are not anywhere near let's be very clear about it we don't have a concept of uh, civil military fusion the way it is there in any other you know other developed countries if you want to be a important player of that global power matrix which i showed earlier i think this is my way of looking at it you need four facets of civil military fusion the first is politico military fusion the second is information strategic communication and new technology fusion then you need to have the traditional industrial civil military fusion with many people in india talk of when you i mean the interesting thing is i've heard this talk from uh, very in- intelligent people educated people and people who do research professors everything uh, in great think tanks when you talk of mil- civil military fusion everyone takes out the chinese model and re- reads it out to us as to what they are doing and then they say we should ape them that's the worst thing we can do because it doesn't suit us and the second part of the story is we need we have a we, our requirement of civil military fusion is completely different 
So then the third part, like I said, is industrial civil military fusion. And last but not the least, unit economic and financial fusion. If you don't have these, you're going to be struggling, right? I've broken up this entire mega thing called the civil military fusion in small parts so that we can understand it better. It's not necessary that all of them have to be, uh, uh, you know, achieved at the same time. They can, that's why even you disaggregate it, then you say, okay, you have different landmarks for each and different milestones for each. You can achieve it and keep going ahead without being interdependent completely uh, beyond a point. Okay. Now, what is this uh, political military fusion all, all about? It is the ability to maintain the balance of power. If you want to be, get into the you know, global power matrix, you have to be able to maintain the balance of power. So that means you need capabilities to be there. What does it mean? It means preparing nations for war. Because in preparing nation for, a nation for war, you get the capability development and the power to be part of the matrix. Okay. And then you have to be very clear if you get into conflict situations or confrontation situations, what are your aims, terminal objectives, and exit strategies when in conflict. And that's what you're seeing in Russia. Russia has got into conflict, great power, it's not able to get out of conflict. And I might, uh, I, I'd like to give an example here. Once, long back, uh, our Prime Minister Vajpayee Ji was asked, so why don't you prosecute a war with Pakistan? And his answer was, yes, we will fight and fight. What so that kind of a thing obviously was not there at that time. And since that clarity of thought was not there between the civil and the military, we couldn't prosecute war much against most of our wishes that we should have sorted out Pakistan 20 years back. And then you need to have clarity in the role of armed forces in internal situations. And that is very important. Right? If you don't have that clarity of a role of armed forces when in being employed in uh, internal situations, we're going to struggle. Okay. Well, I'll highlight both of this. Right. Look at it. You know, take the Russian model of, uh, you know, I, because that is there in front of all of us and we will be able to derive some uh, lessons out of it. Look at Russia. It had a clear aim to start. How to keep NATO out of Ukraine? How did to achieve it? It was very clear that I have to prosecute a, a, you know, military offensive. But then the offensive lacked training to prosecute regime change or maneuver. So there was no clarity or there's no fusion in this whole story as to how they could do regime change in Kiev. If they didn't do it, they, they, they floundered. And then when the, when the whole thing came to shove, came to the push, or the push came to the shove, they couldn't maneuver. Their lack of maneuverability and their inability to maneuver them from basic fundamental training. And that fundamental training is lacking because of conscription. So the military civil fusion said, go for conscription. But then you weakened your army. And as a result, now you're going in for, you know, uh, professional military contractors like Wagner to do your dirty jobs. Okay. On the other hand, look at Ukraine. In what has emerged is that they were preparing for this war since long with complete political military fusion. Whatever you might say about Ukraine, that he is dependent on uh, USA, he's got no economy, no nothing, but it has lasted 16 years with almost nothing against a, a great global power, which is, supposed, which is supposed to have the greatest military, one of the greatest militaries on earth, with almost nothing. Borrowed equipment, everything. But there is a very clear case of political military fusion. Now you look at EU, NATO, or USA. They are very clear not to get involved in war, but they want to support Ukraine and lead Russia in a hybrid war. There's complete political military fusion there. They have been able to fuse their political objectives with their military objectives, and they're achieving it through Ukraine. It's always now, these days, it's said, that these three people will fight 
the russia will fight russia till the last ukrainian we don't know the outcomes but you see why russia has not been able to make headway because their political military fusion is lacking in fact if anything today it is on a, it's tottering right we don't know whether putin will be displaced or not it might not happen but you find that you know fusion is not there on one side okay now let's look at it internally look at in manipur what's happening in manipur now this is the you know message which the indian army put out fabricated attempts to malign image of assam rifles for all those of you who don't understand assam rifle assam rifles is not a paramilitary battalion a paramilitary force in the true sense right it first and nor is it a northeast force it's an all india all class force one number two it is officered by the indian army completely and it is only employed under the indian army or in, independently it is never even employed under uh, the normal police or the normal state also okay it's a, it's almost an army i mean it's an army and it is under the operational control of the army now if this force which is used only sparingly for you know, you know uh, certain purposes have to say that has to say the last paragraph indian army and assam rifles assure the people of manipur that we will continue to remain firm and resolute in our action to prevent any attempt that could result in furthering violence in an already uh, you know volatile atmosphere then there is a very clear case of lack of civil military fusion in fact i this problem has been going on for so long it is very ironic that the government of the day whether it's in the state or in the uh, in the center calls out your own force and then you file an fir against it you can file an fir against the individual in that force you can fire a fir against the battalion in that force for having this thing but you can't file an fir against assam rifles at large and then say maintain peace so there is a dissonance even if you have to do this then it lacks fusion if this fusion and common thinking is not there uh, things will not get solved in fact it is unprecedented and this unprecedented situation is what the dg assam rifles himself has said two days back in uh, an interview so if you have this kind of a, a problem you are not going to get anything done and if you don't get anything done in an internal problem you can't you might not be able to do something in an external problem tomorrow remember if you have stomach ache you will definitely not fight and today you know manipur is not even a stomach ache it's a bit of a headache also because it has got external dimensions it has got internal dimensions it has got internal dimensions to the state and it has got regional dimension and we don't have a civil military fusion there political military fusion there okay right then i'll talk of the information strategic communication and new technology fusion what is this all about i had shown you the slide earlier on uh, you know military technologies of the century it's all about information battlefield transparency etc 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 all this i have put it and the info in the important aspect is that this civil capacity is being developed at scale in the civil sector and can be used in war for example spacex starlink is being extensively used in uh, you know ukraine so is cloud amazons so is the ai being uh, developed by microsoft has been deployed in ukraine you'll be surprised and all these ideas where did i get it from i got it from a conversation between eric smith who's the, who was the ex ceo of google right and uh, this chief technology officer of OA, open ai and the chat gp t4 that firm they were talking in an open thing in for about 40 minutes conversation and they spelled out how these new technologies are being used in war and the transfer is from the civil domain to military domain and it has been it has happened in the context of 
you know, from USA to Ukraine very seamlessly. Right. All these dual purpose uh, new technologies are ideal for civil military fusion. Okay. That brings me to the next point. Recently, our prime minister went to USA and uh, met uh, President Biden. And we decided on something called ICET. That is Initiative on Critical and Emerging Technologies. And this is the fact sheet put out by the White House. It's unprecedented in its scope. I've never seen it happen like anything like this in my whole life. Right? And what did this talk of? It spoke of the ISEC speaks of semiconductors, artificial intelligence, uh, quantum technologies, advanced wireless communication, space, launching a new innovation bridge that will connect US and Indian different startups. Actualizing the civil uh, nuclear deal, basically, in my view, we need to get more plutonium and thorium reactor technology and much more because that energy is what our, we need and we are deficient of. And all this is, was put in this fact sheet. I just put it in point form here. Now, how do you convert all this into actuality? Is You will not be able to do it, right? if you don't have civil military fusion. And it, even if you have civil military fusion, this con conversion and application across the civil and the military side will take eight to 10 years. So you need to think differently if you want to get on to being an important player in the global power matrix. Not that we are not important, but you need to be more relevant. And you need to be more relevant because you today are the fifth largest economy. And as you want to transit to the third largest economy and zero in on to China, you need to do something different. And unless you do so, you also don't deter China from doing what it, all the nonsense it is doing on the LSE. Because China respects strength. And your strength has to be derived from these technologies. Okay. Now, when you look at it holistically, right, what do you see? When you look at the industrial fusion, you must understand, we spoke so far that the US uh, capacities defeated the Germans. But more importantly, it was the Soviet capacities of the last century which defeated Germans. In the first phase of the Second World War, till about 1944, still Stalingrad took place. You know, the Germans were on the ascendancy and they finished off complete the Soviet armory. In the face of the enemy, the Soviets, from the very place of Ukraine, Kiev, right, they shifted their factories, tank factories out and took it beyond Moscow to the east, rebuilt them and started building, uh, you know, huge uh, cap capability and put tanks on the ground to fight Battle of Kursk in 1944. From 42 to 44, a matter of two years. And Kursk has been the biggest battle mankind has ever seen, where at a point of time, there were over 2,500 tanks in motion. And even today, Russia's huge industrial capacity sustains its war effort over the one and a half years this battle has been on. Now, what you have to see is Russia's huge export capacity has been converted into search capacity to sustain spurts and long wars. Here is a lesson. When you have an MRO capability of aircraft uh, instituted in India, it also gives you the ability to sustain long wars. If you have an export policy, which the government has started, it is a fledgling uh, you know, steps. But if you increase your export capability, that export capability will help you tomorrow to you know, uh, go through a Let me assure you this. You start exporting ammunition to all our neighboring countries, make all our neighboring countries dependent on us for their uh, uh, warlike stores and dual uh, technology uh, stores, including Myanmar. Right? And you'll find that um, uh, uh, China will start backtracking. And your power structure will undergo a tremendous change. Okay. And you don't need great technologies for this. Existing technologies. 
may be technologies which are even a quarter century old capability okay so what is what is it that we have to do in you know to uh, uh, look at it i have looked at five clusters okay what is this five clusters and these five clusters are based on our own capability the first cluster is successful in key sec sec sectors of national importance defense space atomic energy and communications energy and communications where we have had good grounding of technology and where we have achieved success build on your success that's the first part right it's not as if we are not doing it we are doing it space is the example right we're going to have a spaceport down further south near karaikudi right and that comes up your uh, and that spaceport is going more the civil way there is already civil military fusion taking place okay the second cluster has to be disruptive and modern technologies like ai cyber and all these which we have spoken of but to achieve civil military fusion in this you need to have a national uh, program and mission mode and this includes this must include the academia startups venture capitalists established private industry with international linkages and this has to be facilitated by the government you could have ai parks you might have cyber parks you have additive manufacturing zones whatever you whatever you want to do but you have to do it differently what we are doing today is absolutely out of whack you will not achieve anything if the we the way we are going you will achieve something but not in the time frame not in the samrutkal period the way we want it right and you will not be able to convert iset into something pragmatic and enhance the indo us uh, equation right a lot of people talk of being independent and all that i think that age and day when india has to remain independent and non aligned is over you need a major partner you always needed a major partner till now you it was russia okay you needed russia one way or the other we couldn't have won the 71 war without the uh, the deal being signed by mrs indira gandhi and brezhnev similarly tomorrow you want to be a big power in the world you need to have either russia or usa on your side and russia going the chinese way you must hedge your bets okay the third uh sector or the third cluster has to be infrastructure and logistics again here we have achieved quite a bit but we need to do more okay you i mean i've listed everything out rails road airport ports where ye wo all that nonsense but most importantly we have to focus on our himalayan borders and this needs different technologies the standard technologies that you use in airplanes won't work there right and you also have to look at renewable energy or special energy sources for the high altitudes and a lot of people are living there besides the armed forces and development of those areas will contribute immensely to our national fabric and we have to think seriously about it right then you have something called financial fusion right our current financial fusion models or way of going about everything is absolutely archaic we have to think something else you have to think something based on venture capitalism and market principles and then of course the last is the bread and butter technology of goods manufacturing and all where dual use can be exploited you keep doing it which we have been doing so far okay now when you look at it what is the economic and financial fusion you are looking at look at it Russia has been preparing for this eventually for eventuality for a long time that's why they could sub, uh, you know side step sanctions and luckily we know how to do it because we've been under sanctions for a long time through the best part of the past 75 years we've been under some sanction or the other we know how to do it but are we focusing it through that mode and through the, those lenses to ensure our own progress is a question mark you need atmanirbharta okay you need to be able to financially withstand cost of war since uh, you know 
uh, unless it's a costly business war. Russia is able to do it because it owns its technology. Unless we own our technology, we will not be able to handle long wars. And last but not the least, we need to reduce import dependence on China. We cannot allow China to weaponize our trade imbalance. Right? And all this will come through Atmanet Bhatta. On that, I don't think you have a doubt or any one of us have a doubt. Okay. If you look in the Indian context, when was our civil military fusion at its peak? I would say 1971 was the prime example of our civil military fusion. Where we, within a matter of 14 days, we could create another nation. It has never been done in the history of mankind before, or I don't think it can be done after. All you have to see is how Russia is struggling in Ukraine, how USA struggled in uh, Afghanistan, and how China is scared to go across 200 kilometers of water to usurp or rather invade Taiwan. With a small 200 by 200 kilometer here, you created a nation in 14 days. And in fact, the other way of looking at it is you broke a nation in 14 days, conclusively, and you earned 30 years of peace. Okay, now in the Indian context, if I highlight, it is not as if we don't know. In 2019, our Prime Minister highlighted the need for a future ready force at the Combined Commanders Conference. He spoke of shedding legacy systems and practices and have a holistic approach focused on breaking down civil military silos and expediting the speed of decision making beyond weapon procurement. What was he speaking? This is what he spoke. And these words are exactly from what he spoke that day. And what is it? This is all, all about civil military fusion. Are we practicing it? Unfortunately, is he being supported by his own council of ministers? By his own advisors? The, you, you will find the answer wanting. Right? Have a look at this. Right? Our capex in the last budget went up from 27 to 3.3% of the GDP. And people say by the end of this financial year, uh, March, April next year, it will likely to go up to 4.5. And with the GDP now running at about 6.77, in fact, the last quarter being 7.8, this will be easily reached. Right. Emphasis on, there's a huge emphasis on technology upgradation, including disruptive technologies. That I said is a thing which I've already said. But your yeah, defense outlay is barely 2% of the GDP. And there's no talk of convergence of any kind. If you don't have this convergence, if you don't invest in your military and for your military technology, I'm afraid you'll not be able to do much in the civil side also. There's a divergence. And look at the next thing, which is actually very funny. India held the Aero India 2023, which featured military aircraft. Recently in Bangalore, in fact, I went and attended it. Right In January next year, we're going to have Wings India 2024. And it is being held at Hyderabad, which is only for civil aircraft. Okay. I mean, the funny part here is India is the only country which holds two air shows in a year. Within a year, that separately for civil and military air space sectors. Now, I don't think this is civil military diffusion. It is civil military diffusion. No other country holds two aerospace exercises. Just think, our defense ministry and civil aviation ministry are not even talking to each other. Okay. Why is it so? It's not enough that, you know, a think tank like yours or a few others uh, speak of civil military fusion and then just forget about it because it's good theory. And it's a good, uh, uh, a good talk and good thought. You need your national thought, investment, and growth to be you know, immersed in this thinking of civil military fusion. At this point of time, I'm afraid we don't have it. And we need it. Right. And if you have to do all this, you need the political will and drive. If you don't have the political will and drive, it won't happen. Now, in this century, the Chinese have displayed that without political will and drive, it won't happen. In the last century, it was the Russians and the US who did it. And the century before that, it was the British people who did this. 
they had the political will and drive to fuse civil and military if you're looking at political military fusion the model is the british model during the colonization period or for that matter even the french model or the german model and the dutch model the dutch had a very good model of civil political military fusion when it came to uh, you know in the colonial times then you need committed funding you have to invest into this you have to invest into this it is not investing into the military it is investing into civil military fusion you invest in dual use technologies you will get the fruits then of course is it to be services driven or top driven or a combination of both that's something which we have to decide but at this point of time i don't think the services have the capability to do so for many reasons it has to be top driven with some person who can really understand technology and do it i keep saying india is unfortunate that uh, manohar parikar ji uh, you know passed away when he did right it is a great sense of misfortune i feel even today because he understood this more than anyone and i can vouch it with personal examples and if he had been there around it today we might be going on a different path we might be very early in that nascent in that path but our path would have been very clear because he understood technology like no one else i have come across in my entire service who could understand this business and then of course you have to stay the course okay you have to stay the course and if you don't uh, stay the course you got to be problematic you have to adapt as things change if you see the old us model is no more the current us model the chinese model itself is morphing day by day every day it's morphing and then you need this political military bureaucratic uh, fusion uh, uh, avm sena did spoke of it but let me tell you why bureaucratic you know in every country the the political representative is elected by us he is mandated by the constitution of india to defend the country and you know take forward the national interests of the nation right in the same way the armed forces by the you know pleasure of the president is given an edict to defend the uh, integrity and sovereignty of the nation and in doing so if by and in giving a protective environment is supposed to take the uh, you know progress the interests of the nation these people are charged to do so officially mandated to do so officially if they don't do it they can be taken to task a military officer can be sacked a politician when he goes back next to the uh, you know to get his vote he can be thrown out by the people if he doesn't do but the bureaucrat he is not accountable in this paradigm in our country he is the conduit between the political bosses and the military superiors and this conduit has traditionally not worked well we have to understand it it is not that the bureaucrat is a bad man in fact i think he is a very good man the best of our country uh, youth join the bureaucracy with great ideal and i have served with great uh, very good uh, bureaucrats and i have a lot of respect for them but why this triangle doesn't work is something for us to introspect right with this i have uh, finished i'll stop sharing and i'm open for any questions all yours the floor is open thanks sir <clears throat> thanks for this very informative eye opening and enlightening talk sir in fact uh, not only you have reiterated the thing how it should be go about so you have mentioned the four facets the political military fusion i think uh, how and when it will come yes you have said that yes political will power and the top driven approach has to be there let's hope sir for atmanirbharta we have to depend you have very categorically said that we have to either take side uh, whether we go with i said and go with usa or go with russia but russia of course with the chinese the way they are uh, waning and decreasing their influence maybe we have to be, head uh, hedge our bets with the us sir you have very nicely explained the five pluses to go ahead 
and uh, we are somewhere having all those things we are debating in the country we are having but somewhere you have also highlighted the gap which is existing maybe somewhere in our uh, the way political military uh, you uh, gave the example of manipur how uh, there this fusion is not there how we the gap is there the narrative build up is not there somebody attacks and we cannot defend at least narratively and uh, of course today is the uh, uh, world is fully driven by this narratives and today's indian uh, times of india sir uh, swami nomics it says that how the western media is projecting the war uh, of course you gave the example that both ukraine and the russia both had prepared very well with the civil military uh, fusion but still the nato has the up in because they are driving the whole narrative and russia though it is uh, uh, today it is uh, seems to be uh, getting defeated but it is not so swami nomics very categorically says and in fact they are going to bounce by the in the economy also so all this narratives and all these things is known but still i don't know sir why and let's hope that your this enlightening lecture is heard by somebody from the pmo and somebody from the top so that the political military bureaucratic fusion takes place at least we take ahead sir i have got two three questions for you so the first question is very categorically said that uh, we conduct in a year two aero show uh, in uh, by annually Uh, aeros uh, aero india for the defense and then the other one which is going to be held and Wings both india. are happening yeah we in india and both are happening sir in on the tarmac of the air force uh, this thing one elanka and one is the begum pet why the services can't and of course you have said and then you have kept quiet there the services should at least they should come forward and they should propose that lesson why we can't have one any 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 i don't know this sir i mean i why, why should the services do that's what i keep saying it's a political masters who have to think why is somebody the has to throw, somebody has to throw the bait to somebody has to put the papers to listen it's a high time that we put the resources together if the civil I, I, look 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 if the civil aviation minister and the defense minister can't sit across the table and talk about this why should the uh, why should the chief of the air, air staff uh, think of it i mean i would say I, look and that is why i'm questioning it let me put it this time i'm from services i'm questioning it i, who I else has questioned it the... who else has questioned it i've questioned it now i've questioned this is not the first time i'm questioning it the second time yes sir yes sir you you are uh, i am with you sir i am saying that the air uh, air force which always project that all the air power assets is with supposed to be in the war time should be with the uh, air force so they should be the, there and they should project a listen we, we have to go together anyway sir, i agree with you yes. i agree with you but maybe they have done and not not been listened to who knows yes 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 sir so the one question which has come very uh, this thing why large army and this is from the madam sumitra why large armies have not won any war against small armies is it because of a uh, good civil military fusion example look uh, no uh, let's let's put it this way large armies have not fought with each other first and foremost so we don't know who's won who's lost okay <laughs> and large armies who have fought have fought outside their country and it is just not large army which can win against a small army it is what's the armies which are fighting across in a piece of terrain in a piece of terrain only that much army can be deployed you just can't you can't put 40 chaps in a room which is supposed to hold only three people so where this the entire russian army is only fighting in ukraine which is only one part of the whole thing similarly tomorrow china if it fights against india along the himalayas can only deploy that much of its army it's like entire army we cannot be deployed just because you have a large army doesn't mean you deploy everyone there to the detriment of the rest of your nation so actually when you see any battlefield the opponent opposing sizes are almost the same except in asymmetric situations which have happened in, uh, in afghanistan and in vietnam even there the asymmetry is in technology 
not in the forces. If you see, Taliban had probably more fighters than the Americans had there. Okay. The Vietnamese had more people on ground than the French or the Chinese or the American or throughout the history. Okay. So there is a difference, the thing. So the concept that you just because you have a large army and you know you must win or you you are bound to lose against a small army, you need to rethink. You need to rethink in the practicality of the situation. Yes, sir. You and sir, this uh, uh, reminding of the technology. Uh, why uh, is today, sir? Uh, we uh, should go for the disruptive technology and not for the conventional technology. The war will be not be the conventional war. It will be the uh, this thing. So uh, the question arises: How we uh, prime this uh, disruptive technology? without a proper structure sir so what structure you will like to say uh, at least in the technology because at least military and bureaucracy they will come but why not the technology uh, the industry they come by themselves and propose a structure that how we can go ahead how we can contribute why not the industry you, should look, come forward okay yeah i get a point let me give you a little secret out okay if you think that entire technology is being produced in the uh, private industry in uh, USA, you're out of uh, the equation. The fundamental technology is produced in government funded and government owned, right? That's or government sponsored mm -hmm. research laboratories, even in USA. The Livermore lab, which in USA is not a private lab, it's a government lab. So, fundamental research of uh, technology has to be done by the government. And that has to be done across the scenes of military and civil, which is not happening in our case. I'll give you the classic example. Classic example is happening in front of our eyes. Space and missile technology are you know, next to each other. And yet our defense research and our space research don't look in the same direction, right? Though both are success models, the success models are quite different. Right. How, could you, how could you not uh, have a model as cheap and as great as ISRO in our DRDO? So it is a political thinking which has, come, has to come in. And I'm not talking here today, the military is not in this whole story. I've given you where DRDO is a civil, largely a civil organization, ISRO is a civil organization, and you are looking at it under the government of India. And this is not a punt on the current government. This is our historic problem. Right? True. Both are True. success models. One is a costly model, one is a cheap model. Okay. Why have we not been able to even synergize these to our benefit? Which means that, like I said, our political bosses lack something. True, sir. True. Uh, what you are saying is very correct, sir. ISO and uh, uh, nuclear. Uh... Our this thing comes directly under PMO. PM directly hits, sits on their head, and that's how it is giving. And DRDO maybe so that may be the answer. So the last question of the evening, uh, though you have already uh, uh, defined this, Mr. Vijay Raiji is asking, what are the key drivers of for Bharat to be future ready in the short and long term, both in hard, soft, and smart ways? You have, uh, sir, has already told about the five clusters. But anyway, sir, would like to. Retreat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, the first thing I will put it, in fact, uh, I had an interaction with someone very high up a few days back uh, as to how do you, you know, actualize ISET. I, I told him the same thing. You have to get into a knowledge loop, right? Unless you get into a knowledge loop with the technologies, you build knowledge and you use your academia in a great manner. And you use synergize the private industry, and unless you do that for each cluster, each cluster has to have its own knowledge loop, and each cluster has to have, you know, interconnectivity at the appropriate levels from grassroots level, mid level, and the top level. Unless you have an integrated approach to each cluster, which I have said, and where you build long term knowledge, you uh, will have a problem. And this is something which I, the look, luckily for us, the government is seized of this problem. It is not as if I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to even 
blame this government or any government. I'm talking of our culture so far. And the way we have grown as a nation, that's our, that's our problem. After all, we have a huge colonial hangover where our complete education system was destroyed. The fact that you come here is a great thing, right? And But what we can do ahead is much more, and that's what we have to focus on. And I think the government is doing the right thing. It's up to us to respond in a, a large manner. That's my sense. And I, that's my sense after speaking to some of the people who have come and have had a discussion on this and the capability which we have in our country. I am very sanguine that given the right environment, we can do wonder. And maybe this Chandrayaan thing will spur most of us to look together and look inward and look towards each other to you know do the right thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. We have the capabilities, but we need some spur, some spark. Thanks, sir. Thanks once again. And over to uh, Madam Sumitra. Thank, thank you, Lieutenant General P.R. Shankar, for this enlightening and interesting talk and taking some questions from the audience as well. We really appreciate you spending some time with us today. I wish to thank ABM Sinha for moderating the session beautifully. Finally, I wish to thank all the members of the audience for joining us today. Uh, I just wanted to make an announcement that the next two Sundays we will not be having this talk, but we are postponing this talk to 23rd September and 24th September. Uh, and our speakers will be General Atta Hasnain and General D.S. Huda. So please join us on 23rd September Saturday and 24th September Sunday. Thank you all. And thank you and Jehan. Jehan. Jehan.